Long, long ago in a far, far away land, at the end of the earth, as the morning sun announced its imminent arrival with scarlet rays outlining the dark horizons of this wild land, revealing a panoramic cloudscape stunning to behold, the smell of fresh rain on the sand, a gentle breeze waving the branches of the evergreen trees in a final gesture that bids farewell to the night. Breathtakingly beautiful, this faraway land at the end of the earth awaits events that will change the course of history of all the people of the land. Southeast Angola, Kwando Kubango Province, the MPLA's sixth military region, Terras to Firm to Mundu, the lands at the end of the world. That was what the Portuguese called that part of Angola in the south and southeastern part of the country, north of the southwest Africa border, because the area was so remote and so desolate that it certainly earned the name. Using Google Earth, some Russian 1 in 200,000 scale topographical maps, which are scanned images, and some other sources of reference, I took on the challenge to recreate a specific area in dispute as a layered, more or less three-dimensional representation of which I could keep on adding and removing information without cluttering it up with a tremendous amount of information that I intended to load. My first attempts resulted in a large scribble board of colors and notes and crosses and circles and arrows and plotted coordinates, unit designations, etc. that were frankly unusable by and unpresentable to any normal interested party. This result was much better, and I hope to create a comprehensive understanding of the events as they developed on that day in question. Unfortunately, this presentation became far larger than what I anticipated, and therefore I had to break it up into four parts, which I will present over four days. A, the area in dispute, presented today. B, the Cuban Poplar forces and their defenses, presented tomorrow. C, the South African UNITA forces and their plan of attack presented the day after. D. The actual sequence of events of the attack presented the day after that last one. A potential fifth part can cover the aftermath and implications of the attack. So, where exactly are we then in this remote part of Southeast Angola? The general coordinates of the areas indicated are 15 degrees 10 south, 19 degrees 15 east. The slide provides a general feel of the area, and I really do hope you get a sense of the lay of the land. Note the higher ground to the west of the prominent river running from north to south, and the gentle rolling low hills towards the eastern side, with a largely flat area in the center, between the tributaries flowing from east to west into the main river. These are the main features of the immediate area. The entire area to the east of the Quito River is exceptionally sandy. Even the higher ground, and during the rainy season, mostly November through February, the sand around the rivers, or Anharas, and in the Shanas, become muddy and certain vehicle traps. Not a single stone can be found anywhere. I remember there were some boulder-like rock outcroppings on the high ground I was deployed on, though. Keeping our reference point in sight, Let's start by naming the rivers and tributaries in question. The prominent and very much main river flowing from north to south is the Quito River, which runs directly south and southeast on a varying course to where it joins the west flowing Cubango River on the border with southwest Africa, near Mucuso, some 360 kilometers to the southeast. The photo shows an aerial view of the Quito River. One of the main tributaries of the Quito River, in this particular area of dispute, is the Quanavala River, joining into the Quito from the northeast, making a sort of Y with the main river. Flowing into the Quanavala directly from the east and bordering on the northern edge of our area in dispute is the Quater River. Moving down southward along the Quanavala River, the next tributary joining it from the east is the Dala River, much shorter but jutting into our area in dispute, thus forming a major obstacle which serves to channel movement alongside it. 
from the west, a minor tributary called the Tiengo joins the Quito River, a short distance south of the confluence of the Quito and Guanaval rivers. Oops, I think by now you all know where we are. Almost directly opposite the Tiengo, flowing in from the east, is the Tumpo tributary, its own smaller tributary spreading out like fingers towards the east, directly into our area of dispute, forming the east and southern boundaries of the area which infamously was to become known as the Tumpu Triangle. Note how the origin of this tributary is virtually on our reference point, marked in green. Quite a few kilometers further south along the Quito River, the Shambinga River flows in directly from the east, thus forming the entire southern boundary of our area in dispute. This river played a significant role earlier, but more about that later. So, now we all know where we are, and just to put things in perspective, north is indicated, as well as a distance scale in kilometers. The area in dispute displayed here is about 36 kilometers wide from west to east, and 24 kilometers high from north to south. And yes, for the war gamers here, this area will fit on a 2700 by 1800 millimeter, or 9 by 6 foot, war games table, representing a ground scale of 1 cm equals 133 meters. You can round it to either 100 or 120 meters for convenience. To continue, let us start identifying the general areas. The general area and higher ground to the west of Quito River, in this area of dispute, is known as Quito Guanaval. You guessed it. With the Quito River being at the lowest altitude of the entire area in dispute, just below 1,200 meters above sea level, it is significant to note that the three high points on the western side of the river, in the Quito Guanaval area, from north to south, 1,311 meters, 1,262 meters, and 1,248 meters. Note that the area north of the Tiengo tributary is about 50 to 60 meters higher than the area south of it. Immediately to the east of the Tumpu Triangle lies the flat and relatively open, almost treeless strip of area known as the Anhara Lipanda, which is the name of the rather large shana between 4 to 6 kilometers wide between the Tumpu and the high ground to the east. The area is only about 30 meters above the river level, with two high points at 1,229 meters and 1,226 meters. Other notable high points are the flanking high ground at 1,272 meters to the north and 1,255 meters to the south of the Anhara Lipanda. To the west, south of the Tumpu tributary, is high point 1,232, not much higher than the Anhara, but serving to effectively block the direct line of sight between the southern part of the Anhara and the Quito River. The view from the northern part of the Anhara is effectively blocked by the trees in the Tumpu Triangle itself. The bushy high ground to the north of the Shambinga River and immediately to the east of the Anhara Lipanda was the Shambinga High Ground, which rose another 50 or so meters above the surrounding areas and as such dominated the area quite significantly. It was covered in trees of all sizes as well as thick bush and was therefore a very prominent feature in the area of dispute. The highest point of the Shambinga high ground was at 1,312 meters, more or less in the center of the high ground, but the view to the west was mostly blocked by a piece of high ground jutting out towards the west, with another high pound at 1,278 meters, which, even though 25 meters lower, commanded a much better view over the Anhara Liponda, an entire western and northwestern parts of the area in dispute. It offered a view of even the Quito Guanaval high grounds on the western side of the Quito River, although the river itself was not visible, as that was in dead ground. To the southeast of high point 1278 was another prominent high point at 1262 meters, which commanded the view to the southwest and south over the Shambinga River, but the view to the northwest and north was blocked by the jutting high ground of point 1278. 
two prominent high points in the north of the Shambinga high grounds were at 1,264 1, meters and 1,308 meters. And on the eastern slope of the high ground, you could find high points from north to south at 1,258 meters, 1,257 meters, 1,301 meters, and to the south overlooking the Shambinga River at 1,245 meters. The area southeast of the Shambinga River was again very flat and low and called Sashimono. It had only two prominent high points in our area in dispute, at 1,214 meters closer to the river and at 1,240 meters, about six kilometers further east. The general area to the northeast of the area in dispute was where the river also got its name from, Quater. The ground rose gradually towards the northeast to a high point at 1,336 meters, which is also the highest point in our entire area in dispute. It only commanded the area directly to its south and southeast and overlooking the Quater River to the northwest. Two other high points, however, also afforded a grandstand view over the Quater River and its immediate surroundings. The high point at 1,269 meters immediately next to and north of the river and the high point at 1,310 meters in the northeast. The high point at 1,244 meters was in dead ground and could only afford a narrow view northwest towards the Quater River. The final high point in the Quater area was further to the east at 1,258 meters. The second last high point to look at in our area of dispute lies to the northwest on the prominent high ground between the Quito and Conaval rivers, north of the confluence, at 1,321 meters, rising 120 meters above its surrounds. This point commanded an excellent view over the Quito River flowing southward as far as you could see, as well as the immediate surrounding area to the east and west of the high ground. It was, however, covered in trees and bush, which made close observation and movement difficult, and was very prominent, so as to be rather obvious as an observation point. The last high point we have to look at is the one at 1,234 meters, just south of the Dala River. Remember that one. Look at the narrow corridor between it and the Dala River, and how it dominates the entire Tumpu Triangle to its southwest as well as the Quanaval and its confluence with the Quito River. More about it later. So what about human presence? Was this place so deep into the lands at the end of the world that there were no human settlements or signs of economic development? No. Surprisingly, the area was dotted with villages and small settlements, all dominated by the little town of Quito Quanaval on the western banks of the Quito River about two kilometers south of the confluence of the Quito and Guanaval rivers. The Portuguese had used the town as a forward base and even at an airfield from which even the South African Air Force operated from in support of Portuguese ground forces in the late 1960s. So as not to clutter up the map too much, I will for now leave out the names of all the little villages. The secluded little town of Quito Guanaval was not cut off from the rest of the world, and amazingly a network of roads linked the town with Manong, 180 kilometers to the west, and Kunjamba, 110 kilometers to the east, where the road runs southeast towards Mavinga. Another main road runs north on the eastern side of the Quito River to link Quito Guanaval with Lupira, 75 kilometers to the northeast. A subset of secondary roads link Quito Quanaval with the many settlements on the western bank of the Quito River, following the southward flow of the river and other nearby villages. A network of paths link the settlements with each other, as can be seen. Due to the nature of rivers in the area, and especially during the rainy season, that's November through February, most rivers and the tributaries become uncrossable, especially by vehicle. It is therefore crucial to look at the few permanent bridges that allow transport to move from point to point. 
of all the bridges in the area of dispute, the bridge over the Quito River, the Quito Bridge, is probably the most important, as it is the only crossing point across the wide Quito River in the entire area for many, many kilometers, both to the south and north of Quito Carnival. The closest other bridge across the Quito River is more than 30 kilometers to the north. This is therefore the only way to move from the west side of the area in dispute to the eastern side and vice versa. It is therefore understandable that this bridge have played a very prominent and strategic role in the events leading up to this particular day. The next bridge to look at is the one over the Dala River on the road leading to the north. The same road leading north ultimately crosses the Quater River at a bridge on the most northern edge of our area in dispute. In the west there is a small bridge for the road crossing the Tiengo River leading towards the airfield. It is interesting that there is no bridge indicated over the same tributary on the main road from Quito Conaval leading south because the road towards the Quito River have been built up as a causeway leading to the main bridge, it is safe to assume this causeway have been built to also cross the small tributary and allow it to flow through underneath it. There is a double bridge across the Shambinga River for the main road leading to the east. The only other route from the south past the Shambinga would be to go around the source of the Shambinga, which lay east of the Shambinga high grounds. This would mean having to tackle the difficult going across the high grounds to go towards Quito Quanaval. This brings us to the Tumpu tributaries, where no bridges are indicated for the main road crossing them towards the east. The Tumpu would have been traversable with no problem during the dry season, but might have led to some crossing problems when it's rained a lot. Within the scenario and time frame we are looking at, the area of dispute, however, the Tumpu tributaries becoming uncrossable is not an issue. Our road therefore runs over the tributaries and not under them. Being the land at the end of the world, the area in dispute is covered in bush and trees of all sizes, except near the rivers where the Anharas, which are wet sandy areas, prevent any trees from growing. Depressions in the ground away from the river become flooded during the rainy season and the sand becomes muddy, causing a severe lack of plant growth, except for the long flowing grass so prevalent and thriving in wet sand. This results in bald spots all over the landscape, which contains no green trees or bush, only the prevailing grass, which is light yellow in colour. From the air this appears as whitish blotches in between the dark greenery of the bush around it. These are called shanos, and they usually have no water source flowing through them, as do anharas. When moving through the bush, you are suddenly faced with a huge open area containing absolutely no trees, in stark contrast with a thick bush right behind you. I have highlighted these open areas on the map so you can see the extent of these open areas of shanos, also called shanos. You will notice that the Anhara Lepanda is a huge open area between the Quito River and the Shambinga High Ground. It is, however, an Anhara because it feeds into the Tumpu tributaries that stretch like an open hand into the Anhara. These open areas do not always only comprise of grass. Some have a low density growth of bush and shrub, but usually have no trees, as the roots of trees have no way of to anchor anything large in the wet sand. Not all shanas will appear entirely white from above. The striking thing about these shanas and anharas are the most complete lack of cover from both the ground and the air. In the dry season, any vehicle driving through a dry shana will result in a huge dust cloud of fine sand, easily spotted by any alert eye on the prowl. To be continued. Unfortunately, this presentation became far larger than what I anticipated, and therefore I had to break it up into four parts, which I will present over four days. A. The area in dispute presented today. B. The FAPLA Cuban forces and their defences presented tomorrow. C. The South African UNITA forces and their plan of attack presented the day after. D. The actual sequence of events of the attack presented the day after the last one. A potential fifth part can cover the aftermath and implications of the attack. 
This concludes the first part of the presentation, and I would like to invite you to view the second part tomorrow, same time, same browser. I hope you found this overview of the area in dispute insightful and that I have managed to create a deeper understanding of the terrain and its potential impact on military operations. But the really interesting parts are still coming. Tomorrow we will look at the size, organization, doctrine and deployment of the Cuban-led FAPLA forces. I hope you will be able to attend. Thank you.